what are we doing today? Well, we're gonna review the Sony A9 III. We're gonna pair it with two lenses, the 2-600 to Sony lens and the 7200 2.8 version two lens. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna check out this new global shutter, the 120 frame second, the pre-capture. We're gonna see how it works in the real world for wildlife photography. So let's talk about it. So, Sony A9 III, why are we reviewing this camera? Well, several things. This is actually a wildlife camera or a sports photography camera. Why? Global shutter. There have been some global shutter cameras, but they've been more video cameras than this. This is really the first hybrid camera with the global shutter in it. For mass market, that is, at least from Sony, Nikon, and Canon. And what does that mean? Well, what that means for global shutter is it exposes all the pixels exactly at one time, as opposed to every other camera reach from the top to the bottom. Now, the Nikon Z9, the R3, cameras like that have such an extremely fast shutter speed, or readout speed, excuse me, that you're almost getting no rolling shutter, because if you have a slower camera, kind of like the Canon R7, or the Z6 III, things like that, A7R5, they read so slow from top to bottom that you can get different wing movements. Like if you've got a bird landing on water, you may have, you know, your wings spread out here, but the reflection in the water at the bottom of the frame, the wings may be closed because it's time from top to bottom is slower. And if you move your camera left to right, you will see things bend or in video, you'll see wobble. What this camera does with a global shutter by exposing all the pixels exactly at the same time, you get no rolling shutter and you get no wobble in video. So that's what makes it really nice. And another thing about this guy is it shoots 120 frames a second in stills in RAW. And it has a pre-capture feature that's really unique and we'll talk about that in a second. So I've had this camera for about a month and that leads me to what I'm going to talk about next and that is Stewart's Photo here in Anchorage. Stewart's Photo I don't make any money from Stewart's Photo. I don't have a deal with them on anything, kickbacks, money, anything. But it is one of the best camera shops I have ever been in, and it has some of the best staff. Bill and Brian are phenomenal, and they're great friends, and you'll become friends with them if you go visit them. So if you're in Anchorage and you need photography gear or you need rental gear, that's what I'm going to talk about here, because this is all rental from this A93, the 2-600, to and the 7200. I had to rent all that stuff. But, he'll know, this camera's only been on the market a very short time, and Stewart's got one in for rental. That's very rare to even get rentals from a camera shop, and that's what makes it nice. Stewart's Photo has a fantastic selection of gear. You've got all your accessories, gloves, batteries, cables drones, cameras, lenses, lighting, you name it, they've got it. It's fantastic. So if you're in Anchorage, you need to rent something or you need to check something out. Also, there's no tax in Anchorage, so if you're buying an expensive camera like this one at $6,000, it's going to cost you just $6,000. It's not going to cost you $6,300 or whatever it is with the tax or whatever. So <clears throat> that's what makes it fantastic. And also, if you need to buy equipment like the Sony A93 or Tamron 2875. I put a smaller lens on this to be able to use this here to review, to show you and talk to you about this stuff. So if you need to buy something, just go to their website. See what you need to do. If you're in the United States, you can buy something off their website. So if they have A93, you can buy it right there on the website and they'll ship it out to you. So that's what's incredible. It's a fantastic store and a faster group of guys and they have been nothing but helpful and supportive of me and all the photographers here in Anchorage. So go visit them and say hi to Bill and Brian and just enjoy yourself when you're up here. So now let's talk about the ergonomics of this camera. This is one of the better feeling Sony cameras that I've held and messed with. Even without the battery grip, this feels really good in the hand. It actually is a lot deeper than most Sony cameras. It's got more of a Canon slash Nikon feel to it to me actually. And the button layout is really good. I've got three dials to be able to assign my shutter aperture and ISO to, really nice. It even has the toggle switch to go from stills 
the video in, in a slow, quick mode. Just, it, it's a lot like the ZVE-1 here and the Canon and Icon. Just flip back and forth through video and that stills. So I really, really like that. Uh, as far as the menu goes, I've got a ZVE-1 that I use that I'm actually shooting with right now. And I've gotten used to the, the menus. So a lot of people talk about they don't like the Sony menus. After just using it for a little bit of time, I don't have a problem getting around the Sony menus, just like do the Canon and Nikon. Uh, be honest with you, the Nikon's probably got the most complex menus, but once you kind of learn where the basic parts are, where where your stills are, where your video is, where your autofocus is, where your custom settings are, once you know kind of where that is, it's easy to get around in all these cameras. So the menu system is really good. Back to the ergonomics and the layout, everything feels good. Everything's kind of laid out well in this camera. I, I I don't have a problem with it. It's real. It was really easy for me to just start shooting with this camera on day one and not miss any buttons because I did the same back button focus setup I have on all my other cameras on this one and all that stuff. We'll get into autofocus a lot later in this video, but uh, it, it's laid out really well. It pretty much combines everything that Canon and Nikon and Sony have into one bit on this screen. Not only can you flip this screen out and twist and swivel it, you can actually angle it also, which makes it, you can get an, any crazy angle with it really nice. As far as the screen goes, the screen's pretty nice on the back. It's not as nice as the Canon and the Nikon as far as the LCD, as far as brightness and clarity, but it's still really good and really more than adequate. As far as the EVF, the, the 9 million dot EVF, really, really good. I haven't had any problem there. You can set 240 megahertz fresh rate if you need to. I left it at 120. I had no problem. There's no blackout when you're shooting. Really good as far as the EVF goes. So as far as ergonomics, layout, all that kind of stuff, and everything, the external and use of this camera, and just it, it feels really good. They did a really, really good job, Sony did with this camera, with all that said. Now let's talk about the coolest thing on this camera, and that is 120 frames a second in stills. So let's talk a lot about that here. So that's what makes this camera to me really, really nice. It is a little bit cold up here on this mountain where I'm doing this review today. You'll notice from the intro to this video to what we got here, the lighting's different. Well, it's, it's a month later. I shot that intro when I first got the camera. Nice sunny day today cloudy so continuity is kind of fun with these videos a lot of times i try to wear the same clothes so that if i shoot it over several days it looks like i'm on the same day but this is a month later in this video but uh it is a little cold out here so if i put the camera down put my hands in my pocket that's why it's 32 degrees up here right now but it is beautiful and i'm also while i'm doing this review i'm seeing if any birds or any ptarmigans show up so i'm kind of doing double duty here with doing this. Uh, that leads me to the next thing I want to talk about real quickly before we get into the frames for a second. It was really nice to get outside and start taking pictures because I hadn't taken pictures since January and it is April when I first got to take pictures again and get back out in the field and I'm still not even 20-30% of what I should be. So it was really nice to see animals and get outside but it was also very frustrating because I can't, I don't have any stamina or muscles or lung capacity to get around very much. So I would, a couple of times I saw some swans sitting about 80 yards out from us. And normally what I'd do is I'd go circle these guys and get the light right, you know, walk about a quarter or a mile or whatever to, yeah, the snow to get that, but I couldn't do that. But other things is really nice to be able to see those animals. So uh, wildlife photography is going to be something that's going to really help me recover more and you guys are too to help me recover more with all the comments and support you guys give me just just amazing but it's been nice to get out and photograph these animals so let's get into the 120 frames a second or the frames per second of this camera and how it does it and the pre-capture really fascinating so this camera will shoot from five frames a second all the way up to 120 frames a second in raw that's what's amazing about that you could shoot with the R3, kind of like that also, but it does it differently. Sony's done a really neat way. They've just incorporated those frames per second just as a normal shutter run when you hit the shutter. 
uh, with Canon with the pre-capture we'll talk about in a minute it attacks it differently that you have to do some ever crazy stuff to unpack it which is a kind of a pain in the butt so I don't use the pre-capture on Canon uh, Nikon does a little bit better but Sony has perfected the pre-capture and 120 frames a second and how it's being used so what it has is a really innovative thing you can set your frames per second and whatever you want to do when you hit the shutter when it takes pictures so for me I set it to 30 frames a second on here and but you can set it down to three five you know all up to 120 you can set it wherever you want it for your main shutter button when you hit it but they also have this button in the front this c5 button and what that does that gives you a turbo so what you can do is as you're shooting this guy on 30 frames a second and then you hit the turbo button you can change or you can raise or lower your frames per second so what I had this thing set to is 30 frames a second, but when I hit the C5 button, I jumped to 120 frames a second. So what does that do? Well, like when I went out to the Sea Life Center, they have an aviary in there that it's open air. It's, it's pretty big. It's probably about, probably about 80 yards or 90 yards total in a big circle. And inside there, you've got red leg kitty wakes. You've got puffins, the horned and tough of the puffin, all the different eiders and different ducks and birds in there that are all native to Alaska. And these guys are in their mating, they're doing crazy stuff. So what, what I could do with this, with the kitty wakes, when they would land on the water or fly, if they land on the water, I could shoot 30 frames a second, but if I see them start to move their wings to take off and fly, I could hit the 120 frames a second and hammer it, and that way I would get them flying off. Now, with the buffer, at 120 frames a second, you're getting a second half to two seconds, depends on if you're uh, lossless or if you're compressed or all what you're gonna get with that frame rate but it's so nice to hit that 120 frames a second to capture all the different wing movements and things like that also with 120 frames a second I would shoot some chickadees out here around An Anchorage I was looking for a black bear that comes out of a tree but uh, the bear was inside the tree still you know resting for the winter hadn't come out yet but I did have a bunch of black cap chickadees just everywhere so they're laying on these stumps and stuff like that and I could sit here in 120 frames a second and shoot those guys as they're trying to feed and what's really neat that you can see them shooting 120 frames a second is you can see the little tongue dart in and out to grab what it's trying to grab at 30 frames a second I may have caught that action or 20 frames a second but it would have been more rare because you're getting less frames per second so that tongue is really 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 quick to dart out there but 120 frames a second you can see it more and capture more of that stuff so now let's talk about the free capture on this camera this is where they did a really really great job setting this pre capture up so the pre capture on this works just like a normal part of the shutter so when you hit the shutter when you're looking back at the pictures that is they're gonna look like just any other pictures in the frame. You're not gonna know which ones were pre and which ones were when you hit the shutter. What you can do in this in the pre-capture, when you go in the settings, you turn it on, you tell it how many seconds before you hit the shutter button, you want it to take pictures. So you can set it down to a third of a second all the way up to a full second. What does that mean? Well, if you're shooting 30 frames a second, you do one full second, it's gonna do 30 frames. You had 120, you're getting 120 frames before it hits if you're doing a full second. What I set this thing to was a third of a second prior to me. So what you got to do, either hold the AF on button down or the shutter down halfway. And that way what you're getting is that buffering or getting that ready. It's recording, recording, recording. And when you hit the shutter button, it's going to grab that third of a second prior to me hitting the button and it's going to get those frames prior and then the frames I hit afterwards. So what does that do at a third of a second? Well, if I'm shooting 30 frames a second, I'm gonna get about nine frames before I hit the shutter. If I'm shooting 120 frames a second, I should be getting about 40 frames before I hit the, the shutter button. So that's what's really nice about it. And what I noticed was when I was using that, when a bird would take off, I would get a little bit of the more of the wing I did a couple of times the puffins. I was way underexposed when I shot it because I swung over there real quick and didn't change my exposure. But you can get them. What I noticed was when I hit the shutter right when he jumped, but when I 
I just had that third or second, I got him squatting down and then taking off. If I hadn't had that pre-capture on, I would have missed that. But the innovation of doing that, telling you, you know, do you want to move a third of a second up to a one second prior to that is what makes it really nice. Because it's like all the others where you do a full second like Nikon does. You got a lot of frames you may not need, especially if you 120 frames a second. That'd be 120 frames. And after you get the shutter, you may only get like 60 to maybe 80 frames before you hit the buffer. That's what would be crazy about it. So it's really nice to set that 30 frames or lower or whatever you do to do that pre-capture. Really fantastic. And what I found is I left that pre-capture on all the time I'm shooting because it just really helped. I guess I got more frames, about 10 frames more. And I normally was hitting the shutter, but it was really nice to be able to have that. Now, what's the drawback? <sighs> the drawback of this pre-capture, 120 frames a second, is what Sony does with their cards. They are sticking with that Type A card. The problem with the Type A card, it's a lot slower than a Type B card. So you're gonna hit that buffer a lot faster, 120 frames a second. Now, 30 frames a second, I really didn't hit the buffer. I could shoot for a long time at 30 frames a second with the Type A card, not a problem. It's just when you got in that, you know, 120 frames a second, it would fill up really fast. If Sony would give up that Type A and go to a Type B, which is twice as fast, almost twice as fast as a Type A, you could get a lot more frames in that, which is really nice. So the Type A is a drawback to me for this camera if you're gonna shoot 120 frames a second. Okay, let's talk about low light with this camera. A lot of people talked about with a global shutter, you're gonna have your base ISO is higher. It's not 100, it's 250. And I did notice with this camera, when I'm using the ISO in stills, it would go to 320 and then it would try to go to auto. So the lowest I would shoot in stills for ISO was 320 with this guy. But with that being said, I didn't have any problems with low light. I was shooting in these type conditions where it's just cloudy, overcast, like with those chickadees. It was really, really dark when I was ever shooting them, but I had no problem with the shutter speed, getting the right ISO, or, you know, I didn't see a whole lot. Now, every image you're seeing here that I have is not processed. It is not developed because DxO that I use for my cleanup and getting the colors right and, and this, uh, was not supporting this camera and the lenses that I was using so I couldn't pre-process them so I just didn't edit them at all I'm just leaving them they're pure raw what you're seeing noise and colors is just what Lightroom and Sony is saying is correct for that normally what I'd use I'd use the DxO to get the correct camera and color profile and noise profile and sharpness out of what the camera manufacturer says as opposed to what Lightroom is saying. So basically the noise level, the cuddle level, everything is more than acceptable and I didn't see any issues with low light using this camera and the lenses because you know I'm using 6.3 on the 2 to 600 not a problem. Uh, even inside the AV area that was a little darker I didn't have a problem using that. So the, the low light performance of this is really good. Yes, it's not as good as using a full frame, all the other cameras, because the Sony a7R5, A1, things like that, but it's more than acceptable. It's kind of like using a crop sensor camera. It's kind of what it acts like as far as low light goes. And right now, with the modern, you know, noise cleanups and sharpness that you can do with Topaz, DxO, even Lightroom now, it's not a problem. So the low light using this camera was really, really good. All right, now let's talk about the autofocus of the A9 III. So it is a touch improved from the A7R5, but not much more. So let me talk about that. It focuses very well. It does very well with the autofocus. It grabs the eye, animals and birds and stuff like that. But it's still having a little bit of issues, especially if you get really low when you're shooting with your camera really close to the water or surface of the ground. It still has a tendency to get lost, uh, which is what I mean by is the autofocus little boxes will be close to the bird, but not really on it. I had a, a, a auklet that was coming to me in the water and I'm shooting really low to the water in the aviary. And it would hit the water or reflections or 
other parts of the water before it would find the bird. Now, the auklet is a grayer bird, but it does have really bright uh, orangish yellowish eyes it, it should grab. So it, it would hunt, 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 and then it would grab. But it was fairly, still fairly quick, but it would miss and go there. And the reason I know this is an issue because uh, Heidi was with me, and she's shooting also, and I would grab, she had a Canon R5. I'd take her Canon R5, i let her run around with this also. And both of us were, the Canon was quicker to hit the eye than the Sony was, this A93. And yes, I have the camera set up correctly. Before you guys start saying that, I tried everything from the wide to the wide tracking to the small, all different boxes, and the effect is the same. Same as I had the A7R5. It is better than the A7R5 as far as that goes, but it still has a little bit of issues there. Um, even when it was focusing on the bird sitting, it would sometimes get the box on the bird, a bunch of boxes, then it would get the box that says, I see a bird. When you get the multiple boxes, when it's going to the full area mode. It's not going into the subject detection. When you see a single line box or the eye box, that's when it said subject or eye of the subject. And you get the little pixelation boxes. Now, it's still focusing on the bird. Even when the bird's in flight, you get the multiple boxes and sometimes you get the square or the eye on it. But it's still locking the bird, which is good. So what I saw from looking at the images when it was through the box and stuff, it was hitting the bird quite a bit. Now, as the birds are coming towards me and things like that the autofocus at 30 frames a second would hang on for most times but sometimes when it got closer to me coming to me it would get a little lost sometimes you do definitely want to stay in the subject detect of the animal you're looking at if you're in shooting birds make sure it's on birds shooting animals make sure it's on animals the bird slash animal worked okay but if i was shooting a animal make sure you have it on animal and uh, like I was at the conservation center I had it on bird just to play with it and sure enough it was jumping around once I set it to animal jumped right back to it same thing with birds if I had an animal it had pixels you know it's doing the little boxes not it was kind of trying to hit the animal sometimes missing it but if I put it on bird it would jump to the bird either the boxes or the single box or the eye box it did really well but again with all these things, I had a Canon R5 next to me. I could be shooting this A93, you know, it would see how quickly it's hitting the eye, and I could pick up the Canon R5, and it was better. So Canon's really good with hitting that eye. It's just it's really the the benchmark for animals, birds, everything for being a subject lock on, especially the eye. Uh, Nikon is with birds is phenomenal just as good as canon it's animals a little bit off uh, this is still really good it's really still hitting the bird when you look back at the images you don't see as many out now again as animals or birds come towards you and away from you especially 120 frames a second 30 frames a second not so much you can lose your focus a little bit i saw some images that got a little soft or out of focus when the thing came to me. I could even see it through the viewfinder when I was shooting that the focus was losing even though I was holding the autofocus down as the bird or whatever's coming towards me. But it's still really good, but it's just a little lacking behind Canon and Nikon as far as that goes. But it's more than acceptable is what I'm trying to say. I'm nitpicking here to compare against the other manufacturers, but that's something you guys want to know is how good is the autofocus. It's really good, but it's still got some work that I need to do at least Sony does in, in my opinion and that's just for my use using this camera for over a month I've shooting many 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 different subjects over this last month now another issue that the autofocus had which has really surprised me was all autofocus I detect if you have limbs or something in front of your subject it'll sometimes hit the limbs but if you have a large limb and you have the head of the animal back here away from the limb most of these autofocuses will grab the subject back there and grab that eye behind that stick. This camera, for some reason, with the autofocus, wanted to hit those sticks more, the big sticks. You know, something like a big stick with a squirrel head or a bird behind it. But the head was very clear. But it still wanted to grab the stick instead of that. So what you have to do again is you got to use a single point to get more on the planier subject but 
with Nikon and Canon, if I hit the eye out of focus, then it would grab the eye. For some reason, this guy, if I use the single point to get to the animal and I hit the eye auto detect to get into the subject detect AF on, it would jump back to the stick. That was very, very annoying. And this happened over and over for a month. I've tried, I talked to many Sony folks that shoot the A1, none of them had the A93, that all they do is shoot Sony. They're complete Sony shooters. They're professional shooters here around the Alaska area. Trust me, they know what they're doing. And they gave me all kinds of advice, but none of it seemed to work with that. Uh, that autofocus still wanted to grab back on that stick. Now, it was overcomable. I could get around it, not a problem. But when I had the bears at the conservation center, uh, three of the big uh, brown bears were out right now, and they were playing and tussling and messing around, they would get behind the brush, which is always a problem. If I hit the focus point to get past the brush to get to the bears it was fine but again if i hit that autofocus button jump back to the sticks normally once you get past the brush and which means the brush is out of focus and your bears are over here your subject most things will stay latched onto those sometimes it'll jump back but most times it'll stay out there this would jump back to the brush every time so be aware if you do have this camera that don't hit that autofocus button again because it may jump back to the brush. You try to use a single point if it's behind brush. That's one thing that I really noticed with this that you had to do a lot. Uh, if you guys do have methods to that you guys have found, with if you have the A93, uh, tell me what that is to get this autofocus to work past that brush. I, I tried everything I could, and that was my experience with it big time again i could overcome it because just like any camera you learn to how to use your autofocus with your camera what its strengths and its weaknesses are just like with the z9 I, when i first got it it had a lot of problems with that with jumping to backgrounds jumping to foregrounds things like that so you had to learn different ways different focus methods to get around that i hate having to switch different focus methods during the day but if that's what you had to do, like I did the Z9, that's what you do. Now, with firmware updates, it got better. And same will happen with this. As firmware updates come out, this will get better. Okay, let's talk about the elephant in the room for this camera. It is a $6,000 camera. It is an expensive camera. Now, it has features that are phenomenal because of that. That's why the price range is where it is. But it is the 24 megapixels of this camera, which is adequate. But adequate is not at $6,000. That's why I don't own the R3, the Canon R3. Same problem, $6,000 camera, 24 megapixels. Why is that? 24 is a good amount of megapixels. But if you need to crop, recompose, you're gonna have issues. Now, I own a 24 megapixel camera. That is the Canon R8, but it's a $1,500 camera, so I can live with that 24 megapixels at $1,500. At $6,000, it's a little hard to swallow at 24 megapixels. Because if you need to crop in a lot, like we took some pictures of swans, and once you start cropping in, you lose pixels on subject, so you get less detail. And you get more, you know, you start seeing other things in there, we start zooming in. And with, you've got 35 to 45 megapixels or 50, you get really used to be able to crop in because when you shoot something small in the frame you got this big frame here and your subjects a little small you can crop in now if you're shooting environmental shots where you want to get landscape with the subject very small that's not a problem when we're talking about we want detail on a subject like a lot of feather detail and eye detail and and fur detail things like that if you need to crop in because you couldn't get close enough to your subject or your subject is small in the frame and you want to crop in a little bit, you have to remember that you're going to lose detail with that crop. That's where the 24 megapixels has a bit of a problem for me for wildlife photography because I've gotten so used to shooting at 35, 45 megapixels all the time. And I think that's really where the sweet spot is around 35 plus megapixels. So if this had been 35, this to me would be a very tempting camera now. Will I own this camera? No, I won't because I don't have the lenses for it. Conclusion on this camera, phenomenal camera. Great camera. It, 120 frames a second, pre-capture, uh, video. We didn't talk about video. So for video, 
if you're a videography this camera is the camera you need to own i really think so if you're shooting just mainly video why because no rolling shutter no wobble when you take this camera and you pan left to right so like you're tracking like i've got a a swan i was tracking taking off you get no wobble no bend on your trees and everything freezes if you're shooting something really fast a drone a hummingbird those wings, those blades are going to be frozen exactly where they are. There'll be no bend, no wobble, just fantastic. But uh, back to the my thoughts on this camera. Great camera. The autofocus is not as good as Nikon and Canon. And what I've seen with it, what I've used with it, and I've had other people play with it too. Same scenario, but it's still really, really, really good autofocus. It's very reliable. I didn't have a lot of shots that I missed. I was like, oh crap, the autofocus failed. I, I could still get the autofocus the way I wanted it for the scenes I was shooting. I had to do a little more work with it, kind of like I had to do with the Z9 when it first you know, came out. But with firmware updates, and I'm seeing this will too, it will get better and better and better over time. But the autofocus is still really good. For the handling, the way the camera feels, great i i was extremely happy and enjoyed using this camera the whole time i've used it for the month i really hate giving this guy back up to take it back to stewart's i really would love just to have it in my arsenal but just for the price and the megapixels i just i can't do it and not having the lenses right now but it is a fantastic camera it, it if you're a sony shooter yeah i'd have this in my bag instantly uh and you know maybe i'd probably still have the a1 well with the a a1 mark ii will it have a global shutter would it be a faster shutter we'll have some of these things this has like the 120 frames second that's what'll be neat to see but the a93 fantastic camera i extremely happy to use it at the whole time i enjoyed it and all that fun stuff but uh, that's my review of the camera so uh until next time when i see you guys get outside and go run that shutter